in the work that we've been doing most recently, we've been thinking about a different kind of aspect of the world that children have to understand, which is learning about what causes what, what makes what other things happen out there in the world. Um, and in a way, this is the most important thing you can learn about the world. This is at the core of our understanding of the world, is understanding how one thing actually makes another thing happen. And it's another of these things, like perspective taking, that people like Piaget thought was something that children could only, um, could only develop when they were relatively um, old and sophisticated, when they were in the school age period. Um, but what we're starting to discover is that even very young babies actually understand something about how one thing makes another thing happen. Um, so for instance, we discovered that babies know about what you might call billiard ball causality. This is the sort of thing where you see a ball hit another ball, and you see the second ball go off, right? And you think, oh, OK, what happened was that first ball caused the second ball to move. It turns out that if you show even seven-month-old babies a sequence like this, where one ball makes the other ball move, and then you show them a sequence like this, where the ball gets close but doesn't touch the second ball, and then the second ball moves, they think that that second sequence of events is very surprising. So the seven-month-olds will actually perk up and look a long time at this strange event where one ball looked as if it made the other ball move, but it couldn't actually really make sense that it was making the other ball move. So even the seven-month-old babies already seem to be predicting, OK, when this ball comes and it hits the second ball, the second ball is going to move off and go off in another direction. Um, so they already seem to have, be making some predictions about how things like objects bumping into each other will how uh, something like an object bumping into another object will lead to a particular effect. Um, um, babies also seem to know something about the way that their own actions cause events. So you can do things like actually tie a ribbon to a baby's uh, leg that's attached to a mobile. And very, very quickly, the babies will learn the way that they have to move their leg to make the mobile move. And it's not as if they're, you know, after a while, they sort of just look at the mobile quickly just to check to make sure that their action actually made the mobile move. And if you move the mobile, mobile over and tie it to another leg, at first the babies will look really surprised. They'll keep kicking that first leg, and then they'll sort of get, oh, OK, no, it's actually coming, something that's happening over here. Um, but babies, so babies seem to be born knowing some important things about causality. But they also have to learn some important things about causality. In particular, um, they have to learn that there are events out in the world that lead to other events independently of your own actions, independently of what it is that you actually do to the world. Uh, and they have to understand that events can be related in quite complicated ways. So it isn't usually just that one thing causes another thing. Often what happens is that you have complex relationships where one thing causes another thing, which causes another thing, like kind of Rube Goldberg machine, or you have one thing that happens and it makes one A happen and it makes B happen simultaneously. So often, causal structure is really complex, and children have to figure out that complex causal structure. Now, we know something about how scientists, and for that matter, how computers learn about these more complicated kinds of causal structures. Um, and we've actually been collaborating with computer scientists who are also working at NASA to try to design robots that will be able to go to Mars and immediately analyze the structure of the rocks on Mars, figure out whether there's water on places on Mars without actually having to send the data back to Earth. So these, are, these little robots are actually little scientist robots that are going to go out and do the science on Mars to try and figure out how Mars works. Um, I always like the idea that we're doing this collaboration, because if you've seen the Mars robots now, they look like toddlers, right? Um, they're essentially, so essentially what these NASA guys are trying to do is to make those robots even more like toddlers than they already are. You know, they're kind of wobbling around exploring, and they keep tipping over, and you have to pe keep picking them up again. And they're constantly getting into things. And sometimes it's good when they get into things, but a lot of times it's bad when they get into things. Um, I think it really helps to think about those robots as being about two and a half years old. Um, so what kind of what kind of things do you program do you have to program into a robot to enable it to do something like learn about the causal structure of the world? Well, there seem to be two things that baby that uh, robots and scientists use to learn about um, uh, to learn about the causal structure of the world. One thing they do is they look at statistics. So they actually look at how often one thing happens when another thing happens. That's a sort of basic thing that scientists do. Another thing they do, as I mentioned before, is that they actually do experiments. They go out there in the world, 
they try things, they see what the outcome of those experiments are. And a third thing that they do is they watch the experiments that other people perform. So a big part about being a scientist is that you go out and you watch what it is that other people are doing, watch their experiments, take down their results, and use it to make your own, uh, to make progress yourself. So if you're thinking about the children as little scientists, you could ask, well, are children actually doing this? Are they capable of seeing the statistical relationships and statistical patterns in the world and figuring out causal structure from that? Do they do experiments? Do they watch the experiments of other people? And the work that I'm doing right now is really an experimental research program to try and see whether children can use all these methods, these apparently very sophisticated scientific methods of learning about the world. Now, you might be a little startled at the thought of thinking babies are doing statistics. Um, but actually, um, it turns out that babies are doing statistics. How could we even ask that question, right? We obviously can't you know, give them a statistics test. Well, what, we can, what, what we've done is to give um, babies and young children everyday kind of toys. After all, toys are one of the things that children are used to, used to having around them that have various kinds of causal structures, things that do things like the blicket detector and the gear toy that you'll see in a minute, different kinds of machines, monkeys that sneeze. And then we try to figure out then we can give the babies different patterns of evidence about those various kinds of machines. And I'll show you how we do this in a minute. And then we can see if the children can figure out how the machines work. So basically what we're doing is making new machines that work in complicated ways, giving them to the children, and then seeing if the children can figure out how they work just by looking at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, so here's an example of the kind of experiment we've done that shows that children can understand statistics. Um, and this is, uses one of our machines that we call the Blicket Detector. The Blicket Detector is a little box that lights up and plays music when you put some blocks on it, but not other blocks. Um, so it's a little box. You put a block on it, and it actually plays uh, Pop Goes the Weasel, which has, of course, driven all of us completely mad. We can't stand hearing the first bars of Pop, Pop Goes the Weasel. <laughs> um, but three-year-olds who we're doing these experiments with absolutely love this thing. This is the greatest thing in the world. So in this experiment, what we did was show the children two blocks. You can see block A and block B. You put block A on the detector, and it makes it go two out of three times. You put block B on the detector, and it only makes it go one out of three times. And now we ask the child, pick the best one and make the toy go. So we're not asking about statistics, but to answer that question, you have to do a little bit of statistics. You have to say, oh, OK, block A is more likely to make the detector go than block B is. And in fact, four-year-olds will consistently pick the two out of three object rather than picking the one out of three object. Even more amazingly, we can do an experiment like this, where now the first block is making the machine go two out of three times, and the second block is making the machine go um, uh, one out of three times, even though, sorry, let me go through this for a minute. So the second block is making it go two out of six times, and the first block is, only, is making it go two out of three times. So in both cases, the children are seeing the block make the machine go twice. But what counts is all the times that the machine didn't go. Um, so it's like doing a little arithmetic problem to actually figure out that, oh, even though the red block and the blue block make the machine go twice, the red block actually makes it go more, it's actually more likely, more probable to make it go statistically than the blue block is. Does everybody here got that? <laughs> no, I'm, I get a little shaky about this when I'm explaining it. And just to make it even harder, we made the red block make the machine go from far away. So we actually made the red block make the machine go in a way that was more unfamiliar to the babies than to the kids than the way that the blue block made the machine go. When we did this, nevertheless, the four-year-olds said that you should use the red block to make the machine go instead of the blue block. So again, think about this. These are four-year-olds, right? So they're just not really doing much addition or subtraction or any of those formal number ideas, and yet they're picking out this rather abstract statistical pattern about these two blocks, and they're using it to actually go out and make the machine go when we show it to them with real objects and real things that are happening.